Hello, and welcome to an introduction to VMware vCloud Director 5.1 Essentials. This course is designed to give you, as it says, the essentials necessary to be successful with the VMware vCloud Director 5.1 product. I will start by going over a little bit about myself, uh, your instructor for this video series. So my name is Chris Wall, and to give you a brief overview of, I suppose, why you should actually trust the things that are coming out of my mouth and showing up on your screen. I'll go into uh, a brief overview of me. I've been in this business for just over 13 years now, and by business, I mean the field of IT. I'm currently a senior level data center engineer at a company named Ahead, uh, located in Chicago. So basically, I help customers and clients uh, with the virtualization efforts in their data center uh, both architecture and delivery. Aside from that, I'm a VMware vExpert, which is a annual uh, bestowed title that VMware gives to those that have evangelized and better helped people understand the, the various VMware products, and a vMug leader, which is the VMware user group in the Chicago area. So if you're ever in the Chicago area, which is actually where TrainSignal is as well, uh, definitely feel free to look up when the next meeting is and uh, stop by and say hello. I also have uh, just over 30 active certifications, uh, including the VMware Certified Design Expert, or VCDX. Uh, I'm number 104, as well as uh, a random assortment, it seems, of uh, uh, Cisco and HP and Microsoft and NetApp and Tintree certifications. I try to cover the gamut because the data center is uh, quite a wide specialty to hold. And probably my most uh, uh, fun project that I do on the side is I'm a blogger at wallnetwork.com. I've been doing it for about three years, and I've produced, uh, I don't know, somewhere around 180 different articles that uh, help technical people find technical solutions. So let's go over this course and what it's going to offer to you to help you be successful with vCloud Director. Now first, I've got to give you a couple of uh, tips, I guess, some assumptions that I'm going to make about your skill set and your environment that will help you be successful with this course. Now, I give two skill set requirements in order to be uh, effective with this course. You'll need to have experience with the VMware vSphere 5.x. And, you know, obviously, if you've got vSphere, you've got ESXi because the ESX Classic is retired. Uh, in 5.x. So there's going to be an assumption that you understand how to install and configure uh, most of the, the advanced features within vSphere, such as DRS and HA and setting up standard switches and things like that. So preferably, you know, a year or two of experience with vSphere will really help you out because the vCloud product lays on top of all of that uh, all those guts that you've learned in vSphere. The vSphere environment is going to form the platform that the vCloud environment will live upon. So just like when you're building a house, you need a strong foundation of vSphere knowledge in order to build this cloud. And I do expect that you have some basic networking knowledge, specifically around layer 2, which is mostly that you understand what subnetting is, uh, what IP gateways are, so that you can get out of your subnet and go to layer 3. Uh, and things like that. I will try to explain as much as I can, but it will really help if you at least know the basics of uh, Layer 2 networking. And I kind of have a question mark. Do you have a lab? Hopefully you do, and we'll go over. There's, a, there's an entire lesson on building a home lab, uh, but I definitely recommend getting a lab of some sort. I'm not talking about blowing $10,000 on great hardware or anything, but having a way that you can follow along with the video will really give you a great grasp of what you're what you're seeing on the screen. So instead of just watching it, if you hear it and you read it and then you do it, the retention rate is off the charts compared to just seeing it. Uh, and VMware provides evaluation software for everything you're going to see here. So you can, from a software perspective, you could really follow along with all the videos without having to invest practically anything in software. It should just mostly be maybe a little hardware, maybe VMware Workstation, things like that. So the key question becomes, what makes something a cloud? And this is something I've kind of poked fun at here and there because 
over the last several years, the term cloud has been abused in some ways by different, uh, different folks and different vendors. It really boils down to having these key phrases met by the environment that you're building. And I've got them kind of ranked by a level of importance. So on demand is a very important phrase that should be used in an environment that's considered a cloud. Uh, it should be something that can be scaled up and down without any significant level of effort on the user's behalf. It should be a very automated process. And that ties into self-service. The user should be able to provision the resources they need to do their job or to you know, build a server to do development on relatively on their own you know, with very little interaction from the back-end team. It should be a pool of resources. You know, there's, uh, with vSphere, we pool our resources to provide a landing zone for virtual servers and virtual desktops. And the cloud is no different. There should be a pool of resources that is offered to your cloud users that can be consumed on demand. It should be elastic so that you can stretch out between two different data centers or maybe different clusters within your data center, and that should be seamless to your user. And then we get down to more of the chargeback type ideals around measurable and standardized so that when someone consumes your cloud, when they build virtual machines within this cloud construct, we should be able to measure that and understand what the cost impact is and standardize, meaning we should understand that when someone deploys a virtual machine, that it gets done kind of the same way every time. They can pick from a catalog of virtual machines to deploy from. It should all be a very standard process. There shouldn't be one-off uh, type efforts where you're having to code around uh, unique cases. You should have a standard offering of virtual machines. And so on and so forth on that list. And there's a the graphic is kind of showing that the, using things like scripts and programs and APIs is giving the cloud management layer the ability to programmatically do the things we're talking about in the phrases so that we can build 300 virtual machines by calling one script or perhaps a distributed workload, which is a workload that could exist on multiple servers, can automatically grow horizontally. So let's say you have two application servers and there's a demand that could be satisfied with a third application server, we need to be able to leverage APIs in order to make that happen. We shouldn't have to ask a server admin to do that. And then there's three different ways that VMware kind of sees breaking up a data center uh, to do different offerings. And they list it as the basic, committed, and dedicated virtual data centers. And they use terms such as pay-as-you-go and allocation pools and single tenants and things like that. And we'll go over that more. But it's basically the idea of offering resources at different allocation models. So that pay as you go, for example, would be as you spin up a virtual machine, you pay only for what you use. Whereas allocation pool, you might be buying uh, a dedicated amount of resources from your cloud. And it may be that you're charged whether or not you use it or not, and so on and so forth. The question also is, why is cloud important? You may not be using it at all in your environment or not really see the value of it. And I hope this course will help just realize that importance to you. Or at the very least, you need to stay educated and, and focused on this because like it or not, it is coming and it is going to permeate throughout uh, the environments of small, medium, and large business. So I kind of break it up into four sections here in that from the organizational perspective, they need a way to edge out their competition or at the very least stay in the game. So with the cloud, it's kind of one of those things other people are gonna to learn to use it and drive out a competitive edge by using it. So therefore it's gonna become uh, what I like to call table stakes uh, in that you know everyone's going to need to have some kind of play in the cloud uh, in order to stay ahead of the game. Additionally, if you've worked in traditional IT for a while, you're probably used to the red tape and the departmentalization of IT. And frankly, the business units and even the C-level executives, maybe the CIO or the CEO, uh, just feel that the deployment models are too slow. You know, how fast can you spin up a virtual machine? It's usually five minutes, 10 minutes, however long it takes to clone the virtual machine. You have templates and that's pretty easy stuff. 
But how long does it take to provision the rules in the firewall? How long does it, does it take to set the uh, the IPs you know in the environment that you have to do a change control to acquire the IPs or even configure the switch so that the right VLANs are exposed? Those are things that are slowing down uh, the deployment models, and traditional IT just is not really equipped to handle those at scale. And I hinted on this a little earlier, but modern applications do have the ability to run in a distributed fashion. Now, legacy applications uh, were not very distributed. They were very siloed. You would, for example, install a SQL server. You'd give it 16 gigs of RAM and four virtual CPUs, and that was it. If you needed to grow it, you either built a new server and migrated the databases, or you could give it you know, an eight vCPUs or 32 gigs of RAM, and then you'd adjust the software. But it was all very manual, it was a very planned process. It was something that required skilled individuals to really sit down and figure out what they were gonna do, and then typically schedule an outage window or a maintenance window and do it. With more modern applications, with the way we're coding today, uh, we can use the ability of the cloud's um, elasticity, where we can pay for what we need on demand to run distributed applications. Like I was saying before, if that application server uh, is running on two virtual machines, all of a sudden a sale is being held by the company and now you need 10 virtual machines worth of workload because thousands of new users are trying to hit your application. But that's where distributed workload comes in handy, where you have an application that can scale and programmatically build the eight more virtual machines necessary and tie it all together without needing an administrator or an engineer to to do that manually. And it would be difficult anyways to have a guy sitting there watching for that and saying, oh, you know, Joe, I need I need four more virtual machines. And then, okay, Joe, the, the heat's down. You can get rid of three of them. It's just not, it's not very feasible at scale. You might be able to do it for a couple applications, but if you're talking hundreds or thousands, you would need a lot of Joes to do that. <laughs> and then the potential cost savings for highly scalable workloads. If you have dedicated hardware sitting on your floor in your data center to handle burstable or scalable workloads, that could translate into a lot of wasted dollars of equipment just sitting there depreciating that may not be used very fully. Uh, so in a lot of times, you can save money by having dedicated hardware on the floor if it's just gonna be used all the time. But in a scalable workload, Typically, you can get better cost savings by going to a cloud infrastructure. And then I bring up career upkeep. And I mean, this is important no matter who you are or what you're doing, and that your career needs to evolve to a point where it's relevant at all times. If you're not relevant, then you have the potential to be uh, rift, reduction in force, or possibly you know outsourced or removed. There's all sorts of negative connotations with that, but either way, you're watching this video because you're interested in learning stuff, so you're on the right path. You, you, you have some kind of desire to understand more about vCloud, so I would imagine you're on the same page with career upkeep. And knowing how to build and maintain private and public clouds, it will be key as we move forward. It just will be a skill that even if you're not an expert at, you should have the knowledge necessary to talk intelligently about it. And really, as we begin to further converge infrastructure, as we begin to have less storage guys and network guys and server guys and more data center guys, uh, branching out into other knowledge silos is just going to be required to remain competitive. You know, the, only, the, only the largest and most siloed environments are going to continue to need a storage guy or a backup guy. I'm not saying that those careers are going to go away. I mean, people have been saying that the tape drive was going to die for decades now, and it's still around. But what I'm saying is it's going to become more of a niche market to need those types of uh, skill sets. Really, what people are going to need at the cloud level is someone that understands, at least at a basic level, all of the four food groups. And by that, I mean storage and server and network and hypervisor. Starting with vCloud is a good way to get your toe kind of dipped into the pool of all those different silos. So real quick, I brought up the definition from VMware on what a VMware vCloud is. This is important because it helps us understand kind of what VMware sees as the vision of vCloud so that you can kind of meet them in the middle with your definition. So they say the VMware solution for cloud computing that enables delivery of 
and they italicize infrastructure as a service. So if you've ever heard of the different as a services, there's PaaS and SaaS, platform as a service and software as a service. Those are nice, but they're not really what we're focusing on with VMware vCloud. We're trying to take the infrastructure that's provided by vSphere and further extrapolate that into infrastructure as a service by way of VMware vCloud. So it's kind of like that movie Inception where uh, if you've seen it, they, they have a dream that they all go into and then within that dream they dream again and so on and so forth. And I use that example a lot in that we've got the physical hardware and then we extrapolate that into logical constructs within vSphere, clusters and data centers and the like. And then we then extrapolate that even further into another logical construct called a vCloud, which is where we can take these vSphere resource pools and then present them, we can carve them up and present them into VMware vCloud resource groups. We'll go deeper into that, but that's kind of the, the model that we're going for here. Now, how does vCloud Director 5.1 fit into the stack? You know, I've been talking about it. Let's visualize it. So we'll start from the bottom. In the physical environment, you've got your storage, your physical servers. We call them hosts. The physical network, you know, your switches and your routers and the like. And then the VLANs are kind of the logical way that we carve up those networks into virtual LAN or virtual local area networks. You then translate it up into vSphere environment, which should look pretty familiar, in that we've got, working from the right side, we've got storage is now translated to data stores. That's how we logically define our storage. The physical hosts are then translated to compute clusters. That's how we take, you know, up to 32 hosts and logically kind of mash them together into a pool of resources. And they even talk about a resource pool, which is how we further logically define compute clusters into smaller groupings of resources. The physical network then becomes the DVS, a distributed virtual switch, although now it's the VDS, but I think they're just trying to show that it can be a virtual switch or a distributed virtual switch, as well as VLANs translate into distributed virtual switch port groups. So that's how we take physical and then extrapolate that into logical. You move up the stack another layer to the orange vCloud slice, and you start seeing a lot of mesh. You notice that there's less silo with the vCloud stack, it starts to blend in some of those items together. So on the right side, we have the provider virtual data center and the organization virtual data center. Notice that the provider virtual data center is a layer that feeds the organization virtual data center. So we take those compute resources, we take those data store storage resources, and we translate that into what's called a PVDC, provider virtual data center. And then those are then the platform or the foundation that the organizations that live in vCloud use. They consume that. And on the left side, we take those networks and we start with provider networks, which are kind of the external networks that tie directly into those port groups. And network pools, which tie into the port groups as well, but they can be further divided into the organization networks and vApp networks. And I'll go ahead and definitely caution you that the networking piece in VMware vCloud is probably the most complex piece that you're going to deal with. So if you absolutely hate networking, this is probably going to be more challenging than if you find this stuff interesting. What I will tell you is that VMware has done a really good job at trying to take as much of the networking nitty grittiness out of VMware vCloud and that you're really not having to deal with any kind of line commands or or understanding any of the features that a switch may need. It's really coming down to, uh, we'll take the example of the provider organization and VM network, the provider network. You need to provide networking to your vCloud that goes to the provider's network, the, the person that's providing the vSphere environment. The organization network is a network that is specifically given and assigned out to one of the organizations that's consuming your network. So any of the vApps within the organization could potentially use that to talk to one another. And the vApp network is ways that the virtual machines within a vApp can talk to one another. So we're just taking kind of a broad view at the provider level and shrinking that at the organization level to make it more granular. And then even most granular is the vApp network. It's ways that we can slice these networks up to provide the services necessary to 
properly give networking resources to your consumers. So here's what you can expect from this course. Thank you for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.